Hi, my name is Dr. Schlang. Many of you work from my in-school dentistry, dental practices in many states. And uh, this video is all about um, giving the kids a calm and comfortable and pleasant experience uh, with in-school dentistry and also with giving you a calm, comfortable, and pleasant experience and within school dentistry. In this video, I'm going to explain how I do the dental procedures, what materials I use, um, how I greet the kids and try to give them a uh, calm and sometimes fun experience, and um, uh, what I'm thinking about when I, when I go through my day. Let's start to where we, when we get to the school and when I get to the school. Uh, the first thing I, I do is I, I sign in at the front office. Um, I never go right to the visit. I let the school know that I'm there. Schools are pretty strict about who's coming in and who's going out. So you have to sign in and sign out. While I'm doing this, I'm thinking that, okay, who, are, who do I want to make happy? Or who, or who should I make happy? Or who, who am I uh, beholden to? Well first place that I've got, gotten to is the school. And throughout the day, what I'm trying to do is to, to show the schools that I'm, I'm courteous to all of their rules and how they, uh, and what they expect of me. And then I'm providing the kids with a, with a good dental experience. And also I'm thinking about Medicaid. Um, Medicaid, uh, is the principal insurer for the children that we, we treat. And I want to make sure that um, we are good providers for, the, for that insurer. Um, thinking about my team. I want my team to have a good experience during the day and I want them to be efficient. So after I sign into the school, I go to the room where my team is setting up. and. The thing that I like to do before, when we start the day is to kind of get an idea of um, what is the grade range of the kids that we're seeing. Uh, let's see the, the younger ones first because the, they get pretty tired in the afternoon. Also, um, each t team sets up things a little differently. All the rooms, the classrooms that we set up in or the other rooms that the schools assign us to are a little bit different. And um, I want to know where the team put the emergency drug kit, where did they put the emergency oxygen, and uh, basically designate uh, a person who would bring that to me in case I needed it, and also another person who would be the 911 person should that, a situation like that arise. Once that is done, I'll go over with my x-ray tech um, what, I, what my expectations are, and they, they should know it, but uh, I don't like to be, uh, uh, have to ask you know, several times for, for um, the type of x-rays that I want. And um, then I'm ready to see children. Um, when a children, when a child is, is brought to me, um, I'm doing a diagnosis and I'm all, uh, by simultaneously looking in the child's mouth and also um, uh, looking at the x-rays, which will be on a computer screen next to me. When I do my exam, the most important thing is that I be able to see clearly what I'm looking at. Now the program provides um, LED headlamps and um, all dentists uh, today really should wear loops, especially dentists who are um, over the age of 40. In dental schools today, uh, all the students are required to wear loops. So in order to see well, I wear loops and a light that goes on my loops. This is the, uh, the loop and the light and the battery pack that I, uh, that I use. Um, these are my former pair of loops. And uh, the reason why I, I um, 
brought them to show you is that I find that loops are extremely important, not only to perform the dentistry well, but to see the tooth clearly enough. So if you're working on a tooth, let's say it has minimal decay and you're working out on it without anesthesia, for you to see that tooth clear enough that you can um, judge the pressure you're, you're, you're putting on the tooth and help uh, make it the most comfortable experience for the child. I'm always using my loops um, and, and light. And I use a mirror and dry the teeth. And uh, first thing I, I do is I call out the existing teeth. Um, then I call out the existing res restorations. And then by looking at the x-rays and also looking at the um, uh, examining the child's teeth, I call out the new car the caries that, that I observe. Uh, as far as the x-rays go, what I expect when, when, uh, is to have bite wings that clearly show me the interproximals of the teeth. I also need periapicals of all teeth that, sh that have decay that's getting close to the pulp. And also, if the teeth have had prior restorations that are close to the pulp, I need periapicals for those teeth that well, as well because I want to be able to identify teeth that have necrotic pulps, um, uh, regardless if I can, uh, if, there is, uh, if there are any symptoms of an abscess tooth or not. Also, developmentally, for children who are in early mixed dentition, uh, I like to have anterior, uh, upper anterior PAs so that I can uh, see if they have amesiodens or if they have um, uh, congenitally missing uh, permanent lateral incisors. For kids who are in old, uh, later mixed dentition, uh, I'd like to have um, PAs of the lateral cuspid area so I can make, determine whether the permanent cuspids are coming down straight or if they're horizontally impacted and, uh, and, and require early orthodontic intervention. Uh, once I've called out the, the, uh, the caries that the, the, the child has uh, and uh, the exam is co completed, I like to have the, um, the treatment uh, put on a, a post-it so that I can place the treatment that I'm going to perform uh, on the child's shoulder. Uh, this is one posted pad. Generally, I use um, uh, yellow. Uh, purple's fine. Generally, they're three by three, a little bit smaller than this. Um, the the post-it for me is important to so that I don't have to uh, constantly look at the chart to see what treatment that that I need to be doing, and also after I complete my treatment. I, met, I write up the chart using the post-it to, uh, to uh, document the chart. And it helps, uh, uh, use, it helps me to use a post-it, and I expect everyone to, so that it, we don't make errors um, in, um, in writing down the work that has been performed. Um, so that's, that's um, that's basically gets us to the stage of, uh, of beginning treatment. Uh, very important when the child gets to the, to, from the classroom to wherever we're doing the work. However, this classroom, um, very often uh, the teacher who's, whose classroom it is will be coming in and out. Uh, administrators from the school can be coming in and out. So the ultimate open bay dental office that you're using is not necessarily a, a private room. And um, you, are, you are operating in, uh, in conditions that are uh, not exactly uh, like you would find in a uh, fixed dental office. So when the child comes down uh, to, to the visit, it's very important to accurately identify the child as being the person who we have permission for. 
and we want to check the health history and the uh, and the consent and that's usually done by my by assistant who highlights any time kinds of aberrations there are in the health health history but we require two people to positively identify the child um, so that we don't make a mistake and see a child who we don't have permission for. And that is the most important step in treating the child is the positive identification. When the child gets to me, what I try to do is I try to make it a fun experience for the child. I'm not really serious, I'm not very, I don't act very professional. I act like, hey, hi, what's up? I try not to ask too many questions uh, of the child. I try to, just try to make things fun. I tell the child we're, we're going to examine the teeth, see if there are any sugar bugs, and if there are sugar bugs, we'll, we'll, take, care, we'll take care of them. Um, I ask my assistants, uh, to try not to be too authoritarian with the children. I'm trying to give the kids a, a nice experience, a calm, comfortable experience. And um, I generally, well, two things that, I, that I never do and that you should never do is we never um, restrain a child and we never demand a child to, to behave. The, all the children we work on are volunteers, and uh, we want to give them a pleasant dental experience. Uh, it helps if, um, if my assistants don't act like uh, we're doing something that, let's say, could cause pain. Because if they act that way, then the child is fearful from the get-go. So I try to keep it light. I try to make it so that the dental assistant um, doesn't order the child around. Um, when, I, when I do something, I don't ask the child for permission. I just say, uh, I'm going to do this. I don't follow it up with, okay. And the reason why I don't do that is because it gets confusing to the child if I'm always asking questions. So I try to like, uh, be like the Nike slogan, just do it. I try to be fun about it and I try to give the, the, the child a, a comfortable experience. When I'm ready to do the procedures, uh, I have to decide whether I'm going to use anesthetic or when or whether I'm not going to use anesthetic. Uh, we use electric can pieces in the program. Electric can pieces don't make a frightening whine and they're very smooth. And um, our dentists have found that they can do the majority of the fillings without giving anesthetic. And then it comes, comes down to uh, how, do, how do I make the decision whether I'm going to give anesthetic or I'm not going to give anesthetic. And um, basically that decision is made by me getting a feel for what the kid's greatest fears are and what type of procedures that I have to do. Um, because it's a large lesion doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to, if I'm treating a large lesion, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to give anesthetic. Because many times I can make my outline form um, with burr, and after my outline is done, I like to have clean uh, vertical walls and a clean gingival floor. If I have uh, two millimeters of clean vertical walls and a and a gingival floor of let's say a millimeter and a half that's clean. Then I stop using the burr and I go to a spoon and I take out the infected dentin and I, t I leave the affected dentin, which I'll get back to uh, in a moment. Um, when I decide whether I'm giving anesthetic or not, if the child, gen a child generally who is over eight, I can usually provide local anesthetic without causing too much discomfort or, or with, let's say, virtually no discomfort. And um, a child who's under eight, very often the local anesthetic is, is what they're most fearful of. In general, unless I, I'm just trying to get a child used to, who is fearful and used to 
uh, having a filling done. In general, I do the worst first and work my, my way to the, the easiest restoration last. And that way uh, I could be, um, uh, I could feel like that I've taken a, a deep decay that could uh, pose a, pro uh, a more immediate problem to the child and I've treated that and instead of um, maybe getting stuck uh, after a couple of um, easy restorations and never getting to the, the deep decay. So the, the rule I try to follow is do the worst first. Um, these, the kids we're working on have uh, the highest incidence of tooth decay, of dental disease, of, of all children. And um, the idea of watchful waiting or um, hoping that uh, frequent fluoride tra treatments and change of diet and, and better um, hygiene habits will arrest decay. It's, it's not something that's very practical. Um, these kids um, don't have a good history of regular dental care. Um, and that is perhaps the number one reason why we're in the schools is because the schools want us to come in because uh, the access to care for these children hasn't been what the schools would hope for. And by us uh, being an outreach program, being a safety net program, we're taking care of the kids who have the most dental disease and who need the care the most. And in, um, in general, um, we're not going to uh, uh, treat caries by um, remineralization and um, changes of, a, of, of other circumstances. So when I diagnose, I'm fairly aggressive. If I see decay in the uh, pits, grooves, and fissures of the teeth, I diagnose it as needing a, a filling. When I'm dealing with uh, uh, permanent molars, I like to put sealants on teeth where there's no decay in the occlusal surfaces. In California, we have um, preventive resin restorations, which are part of the, the Medicaid um, formulary. And um, in um, other states, um, there's really no reason that uh, we can't do a, a preventive resin restoration. In other words, use a burr to get out the incipient decay and then place the sealant. Um, for the um, for the decay that uh, looks like it's more substantial uh, on the occlusal surfaces of permanent molars, um, I always diagnose it to, uh, for restoration. Um, I think this is a good point for me to introduce the materials that I, that, that I use and um, and go over uh, the, the, the curing light. As most of the materials that I use are flow, are, are come in flowable syringes. Uh, one thing you want to make sure uh, with the children who very often when they come to you, they're, they're fearful of what's going to happen. Um, I like them to realize that what's in the flowable syringes is not and when, especially when I put a tip on, that it's not a shot, that it's um, a dental material. So what I do is I take a bit of flowable composite, I put a tip on, and I put it on the child's fingernail. And then I set that up, and I have the child feel, feel it. And I explain to the child that the materials that I, I use are not shots. And that's often very comforting to the child. The other thing that I like to do, since um, we use different types of curing lights, is I like to put a little bit of composite on my fingernail and put the light on it so I can judge uh, how much heat the, light is giving, the curing light is giving off. And um, I will talk to the assistant about the appropriate distances and times she should use for the curing light based on whether it's a plug-in light that may generate a lot of heat or whether it's a flashlight type curing light that doesn't generate much heat. 
Uh, also, we have trainers that go around and, um, and they have uh, uh, meters to, uh, to check your curing lights. Uh, uh, so that's um, covered two things, the curing light and um, showing the child that what you're, what you're going to do is um, uh, what you're using, the flowable composite is not a shot. Now, if I have procedures that I'm going to do um, without using anesthetic, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll tell the child that I'm going to chase the sugar bugs. I'll show, them some of the, show the child some of the equipment. Um, I call the saliva ejector Mr. Thirsty, the air Mr. Wind, and um, my electric hand piece, the tooth tickler. I'll show the child how all that operates, and then I'll tell the child, look, um, I'm going to chase the sugar bugs. If I bother you, raise your left hand. If I don't, keep your ha hand down. And then I'll try to make a game of it with the child. I'll say, okay, let's say I bothered you. What, you do, what do you do? If the le left hand doesn't go up right away, I go, uh-uh. You got to be quick about this because if I bother you, I want to know about it right away. Then I said, I don't, don't bother you. And it's sort of like playing Simon Says. And it kind of breaks the ice and it's, and it's fun. They like having, if you uh, spray Mr. Wind on them, you know, it's, um, on their cheek or on their arm or put the saliva ejector in their mouth and, and try to make it fun. If I'm then at about that time, I'm about ready to use the handpiece. And in the handpiece, um, I'm using one of two burrs to do my prep. I use either a 330 or a 557. And whether I use one or the other usually depends on the size of the, uh, the amount of decay that there is. If, there is if, if it's going to be a small restoration, I use the 330. If it's going to be a larger one, I use the 57. A lot of times in class twos, I'll use the, the, the 557. So then it's prep time. I set, uh, if I'm using a septico equi equipment, I set the handpiece at five to one ratio at approximately 100,000 RPMs. These handpieces can turn at 150,000 RPMs but I've found if I want to be able to work on teeth without get using anesthetic and uh, not hurting the child, uh, approximately 100,000 uh, RPMs is the way to go. Uh, in order to prep a tooth and not hurt a child, it's, it's a combination of the child being comfortable and usually when they're with their peers and they're in a classroom, they're comfortable about the setting, and it's largely about your attitude and your assistant's attitude in making it seem like nothing bad is going on. So the, so the child's comfort and calmness before you get going is kind of important to make it so that if you d use the electric hand piece without, without giving anesthetic, that you have the best chance of giving that, of, of preparing that tooth without causing any harm or causing any pain to the child. So what I, what the way that I approach the tooth and it's always, you know, wearing loops and with good light, I try to use a lot of water and I use the, the handpiece in a paintbrush fashion. And I literally try to paint my way into the tooth. If I'm doing, um, in approximate restorations, for instance, let's say A has an MO and B has a DO, I'll start on the marginal ridges and I'll come down the marginal ridge and create my gingival floor first. And um, one thing I'd like to give you, um, if you're used to doing adults, um, when you do children, um, once you get down to breaking contact in the gingival floor, uh, be careful because there's a, a deep drop off. If you go much further than that, the tooth comes inward very quickly. And then you wind up having to come inward into the dentin to make another gingival floor. 
So let's say I get down, I'm doing an MO on A, a BO on D, and I have my gingival floors for A, and I have my gingival floors for B, and I've broken the contact. In general, if, if, even if I have a little bit of decalcification on the gingival floor, I'm going to stop because I don't want to um, have a drop off and then have to come inwards on the tooth to create another, uh, another gingival floor. Um, and at that point, then I'll start with the occlusal and I'll try to go through the central groove and put it in a little dovetail for retention. On deciduous teeth, when we prep them, uh, you want um, to put in mechanical retention. The enamel is very thin. You're not going to get that great of an enamel bond on deciduous teeth. And the kids really challenge your restoration with um, all sorts of candies that can, pull, that, that can pull them out. So mechanical retention um, is the way, uh, really the way to go for um, restorations that you're um, doing on deciduous teeth. Now the exception that I have to that is that if I can get prep the tooth and find that I've got the decay out, the tooth is prepped, and let's say 80% of my pulpal floor is enamel. I'm not going to really concern myself if I, uh, whether I have retention or I don't have retention in that instance. Because if I can bond the restoration to, to principally all enamel, uh, then I know I'm going to get excellent bonding retention. Um, I think I'll back up a little bit and talk about um, what we're using for the sealants and then uh, talk about bonding in restorations. For the sealants, we're using uh, Ultra Seal Etch. I like it very much. Um, and with this etch, I use a 25 gauge tip. The 25 gauge tip is the light blue one. It's really important to use a 25 gauge tip because we're trying to get the etch into the groove and we're not using brushes. And uh, the narrow uh, tip really helps you get it into the groove. And it also helps from having excess etch all over the occlusal surface. I mean, the important thing with doing the sealant is to etch for 20 seconds. So after, after that, I flush the tooth and then I dry it. And I don't put the sealant material on until I'm sure that the tooth was well etched. And my judge of whether the tooth was well etched is if I could see the frosting of the enamel. If the enamel is, fr if I see frosting, I know the tooth is well etched. If I don't see frosting, I've got one of two problems. Either I didn't etch it enough, or my air is being contaminated by water and the tooth is wet. So assuming we have a dry, that we can see the frosting, the sealant material we're using is ultra seal and um, we want to apply the serial material with a 25 gauge tip and make sure that we're only applying the material in the grooves, uh, essentially causing the, causing the appearance of rivers on the teeth, on the occlusal surfaces, rather than the appearance of puddles on the occlusal surfaces. So thin sealants that fill all the grooves of the occlusal surface for the sealants. Now let's get back to the, to the filling that, uh, that, we're, um, that, that we're prepping. In filling the tooth, um, let's go to the tooth where I said that your pulpal floor is 80% uh, enamel. Uh, I feel very comfortable in applying etch to that to that tooth and then flushing off the etch and then using a bonding agent and a flowable composite. The bonding agent we use is, is Prelude 1. It's, uh, it's made by Danville. Uh, comes in a little bottle. We have these um, micro applicators. What I suggest is that you don't use the micro applicator straight, but you bend it at the tip to a right angle. You apply it to the, to the preparation, rub it in, spray some air on it, 
wait a full 10 seconds, and then light cure your bonding agent. For this tooth that we've been, this hypothetical tooth that we've been talking about, where, we're, um, where we've etched it and we put the bonding agent on. Um, I like to use a flowable composite called Accolade SRO. Uh, the, and I like to use the extra light shade of Accolade SRO. This is made by Danville. As, um, it's, Danville is also the, the manufacturer, as I mentioned, of the bonding agent. And what I like about this, it's very, the Accolade SRO, it's very radio opaque. And I like the extra light color. And the extra light color is essentially as white as my lab jacket or as light as a sheet of paper. Um, and that accomplishes uh, a couple of things. One is when Medicaid reviews um, our work and they're looking at x-rays of our, of our fillings, they like to be able to see dense fillings. Um, and Accolade SRO has the most barium of any flowable composite. Also, um, when, parent, when we've told the parents that we've done three or four fillings in their child's mouth, and when we were using principally A1 and A2, we would get calls from the parents, and the parents would say, I looked in my child's mouth. I don't see any, any fillings that you did. With the Accolade SRO Extra Light and the fillings being white, uh, the parents can look in the mouth and they can see that that work has been done. And as for my point of view as a dentist, I like the extra light because when I go to find my margins, I can um, find my margins easily, very much like I used to be able to do with amalgam, rather than like with shades A1 and A2. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult to, it's more difficult to find your margins. And that brings up a couple of other things. Let's say I've done some class two fillings, uh, in proximal fillings. Even if I haven't used anesthetic, what, I'm, uh, what I am using uh, uh, is a Toffelmeyer with a pedo band to, use, to, to be the matrix for putting in the filling. Since I am, you and, and I find that that doesn't really bother the children at all for you to, to carefully put on the band. And that's where your loops are going to come in handy again and in order that you'll be able to do that carefully. And what I'll do is if I, if for deciduous teeth, if my contact is closed with the band, and generally, in general, I won't wedge. If it's not closed, I will wedge. And I find that the children Contact, uh, the children tolerate that very well uh, without a problem. Uh, getting back to the prepping of the tooth, I talked about the child raising his hand and, and um, if, if the child is bothered. What I'll try to do when I'm prepping, if I'm not using anesthetic, is I try to keep uh, an eye out uh, for the child's hand, hand movement, his left hand movement. If I see the left hand moving, I'll move away to the area of the tooth that I'm prepping and prep another area of the tooth. Um, as I mentioned before, um, my goal in my preparation is to get a couple of millimeters of vertical wall that are clean, free of decay, and to get a clean gingival floor. At that time, I go to a spoon excavator to get out the, the rest of the decay. Now, if a child's tooth is not numb, the spoon excavator is very gentle. Now, once I get down to affected dentin, that means dentins that's hard but stained, I stop. Uh, when I was in dental school a long time ago, uh, the, the concept was as if you left any type of uh, affected dentin, stained dentin, and sealed it up, that that dentin was going to expand. Um, in the 90s, definitive studies were were, were done to show that decay bacteria deprived of a source of nutrition doesn't go anywhere. It dies or goes dormant. So that being the case, as, lo the, as long as you get a good seal for your filling, you can leave affected dentin. 
Um, I recently attended uh, a lecture given by the chair of PETO at UCLA, and she mentioned that um, these days um, there are little shadows uh, below uh, her filling material on x-rays, and those little shadows are the affected dentin that didn't need to be, re to, to be removed. Um, so that's, that's um, spoon excavator is the way that I go for, um, for moving um, pulpal and axial wall decay after I've gotten, I've uh, completed the outline prep of the, of the tooth. At that point, uh, after, in, in preparing the to after preparing the tooth, what I'm looking for is, am I deep or am I not deep? If I'm deep, uh, then in general, I'll put in a material called limelight. And limelight, uh, to put it in, you need a 22 gauge tip, unlike the sealant material in the etch where you're using a 25 gauge tip. And the limelight is essentially um, resin modified dical, uh, calcium hydroxide. And I put that in where the decay is deep because even though if if more than 20% of my pulpal floor is dentin, that I'm going to use um, our etch prime and, and bond all in one uh, prelude, um, there is a, a, a significant amount of etch in the prelude, and I'm a little bit concerned um, in deep areas that that etch will be, ir will be an irritant to, to, uh, to the pulp. So that's why I use the dical. Some people uh, prefer to use resin modified glass ionomer, and for that we have uh, Voco's Ionoseal. Uh, this is another material that you would apply with the 22 gauge tip. Uh, you can use that in place of of the um, of the limelight. Uh, also, if you have a deep proximal box. Uh, and, and you've ba uh, put a band around it, a lot of times there is, there is moisture seepage into the deep pro proximal box. And you'll, wanna, you'll want to restore the tooth using a, a sandwich technique. And the sandwich technique is used, when you do the sandwich technique, you apply the, the uh, resin modified glass ionomer to the deep portion of the box, uh, light cure that, and then, then you use the etch prime and bond, and uh, light cure that before applying, before putting in your composite. Uh, the advantage of putting the uh, resin modified glass ionomer in, uh, in the in the in the proximal box is that the uh, it's it's hydrophilic, and also even though it's resin modified, it may absorb and and release fluoride. Um, if I, once I've taken care of all of those considerations, uh, for the, in the vast majority of cases, I will fill the tooth using my, um, um, using my Accolade SRO Extra Light. And I use this on deciduous teeth restorations and small restorations on permanent teeth. Um, if I'm in a situation where I'm doing class twos on a permanent tooth, or on permanent teeth, or I'm doing um, a large class one on a permanent tooth, then I'll restore, restore using compactable composite. And for the compactable, we have Gradia X shades A1 and A2. And um, uh, it's also good for your anterior class fours. Uh, and it's called Gradia X for X-ray. This too is very radio opaque. Um, that brings me to uh, restorations of, of teeth that, um, of that uh, where we're doing more than a, a, a taking care of teeth where it's more than a filling. And uh, that's, uh, I'll talk a little bit about pulpotomies. 95% of what we do 
our, uh, our restorations. The other 5% would be pulpotis pulpotomies and extractions. Now, when doing a pulpotomy, you absolutely have to have anesthetic. And um, uh, I have a particular way of giving local anesthetic, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it to you. Uh, uh, and I use local anesthetic for the fillings as well if I think the child's going to be receptive to it. If I feel that um, the child is very fearful of local anesthetic and I feel that I can paint my way into the tooth without hurting the child, then of course I'm not going to use the anesthetic. Uh, I do more than half of my fillings not using local anesthetic. Now, when I do give out local anesthetic, this is the technique that I use. Um, I've tried to gain the child's trust, and, and uh, I've tried to uh, be fun. And um, what I'll do is tell, uh, ask the child to trust me. And I'll say, look, uh, what I need you to do is to tilt your head back and close your eyes. And usually the child will cooperate in doing that. And then I'll put a little topical anesthetic. And when if, if I'm uh, in, injecting both upper and lower, for uppers and lowers, I'll always do the upper first. And my technique is to use a 30 gauge uh, blue short needle and uh, have the assistant hand me the syringe underneath the, the headrest so that the child doesn't see a syringe coming. I ask the assistant not to uh, do anything to give it away that, that anything um, like, an, like a, an injection is going, is going to happen. For instance, I don't really like the assistants to put their arm over the child's arm in case the child's arm comes up for what, what I do. I, I find that the way that I do what I do, uh, the way that I give a shot it's, it just doesn't happen. And what I'll do is I'll take the syringe, pull on the cheek, and superior to the upper deciduous molars, just penetrate the mucosa uh, an eighth of an inch and deposit a drop of anesthetic. Then I'll very slowly uh, I'll wait a couple of seconds and very slowly deposit another drop. And I'll do that for a half a carpule. And in general, I get no reaction at all from the child, and the child literally doesn't feel it. Now, uh, for the upper anesthetic, I'm using lidocaine 2%, 1 to 100,000 epi. For the lowers, I'll be, I use uh, for a lower infiltration, not lower blocks. I use septicane, 4%, went to 100,000 epi. And I use the same technique. And the reason why I use septicane is because it penetrates mandibular, uh, at least children's mandibular bone uh, very effectively. And I use the very same technique. The reason why I start on the top is because I've found that the children feel the lower slightly more than the upper. But once they realize what I've done on the upper, that they didn't feel it. They're, they're tolerant to a, a little bit of feeling on, on, uh, on getting lower anesthetic. If I'm doing a pulpotomy, I will do the, the, in, the infiltration, but also give a, 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 on the lower, I'll give a lidocaine block. If I'm going to be working on an upper permanent molar, uh, what I'll do after I've done what I just told you, uh, I'll wait a minute and then I'll go in and then superior to the permanent molar, I'll deposit lidocaine and they won't feel that because by, going, by giving what I did superior to the upper deciduous molars, uh, they're already numb in that area. Uh, when I'm not using local anesthetic, uh, I, t I explained how I dance around the tooth, how I'm looking for the child's hand to move. Uh, I, in general, uh, will uh, be
be very careful that uh, I'm able to get my outline form. Uh, and if I'm not able to get my outline form, then I'll, uh, without, uh, without disturbing the child, then I'll go back and, and I'll give anesthetic uh, as needed. I think that gets me to um, uh, pulpotomies, um, when to do them, how to do them. Now, uh, in, until, let's say, a few years ago, the criteria for doing a pulpotomy was if you had deep decay that, that radiographically appeared that approached the pulp, to just go ahead and de do a pulpotomy. Now things have changed. If you have deep decay, um, what you want to do is ask the child if the tooth ever hurts spontaneously, whether it ever woke them up, whether it hurts when they, uh, when they uh, have something sweet, and whether that pain lingers. If it doesn't, if they, if they report that that is not the case, and you can percuss the tooth and it doesn't hurt the child, then you should try to do an indirect pulp cap on the, on the tooth. And that is essentially prepping, stopping after you have your clean vertical walls and clean gingival floor, going to your spoon and not being really aggressive with your spoon. Then after you have the infected de decay excavated, putting in some limelight, curing that, and then restoring the tooth. If during your preparation of a tooth, you get an accidental mechanical exposure, then you're going to have to do a pulpotomy. Or if the child reports that they have symptoms of, in the tooth and you can see that there's, the nerve is not necrotic by not seeing um, a radiolucent area in the furcation, then you want to uh, do a pulpotomy as well. And the thing to remember when doing a pulpotomy on a deciduous tooth is that you don't have much vertical room between the roof of the pulpal chamber and the floor of the pulpal, cha pulpal chamber. So essentially on lower teeth in your, uh, before you get into the pulp chamber, you'll want to uh, form a rectangle um, in your prep and, uh, and then break through the the roof of the pulpal chamber, and then take a, a two, four, or six round burr and penetrate into the pulp and prep by pushing down without um, RPMs and then pulling up as, as you create, um, uh, as you cause the burr to spin. Um, and that's the safest way. Then when you've uh, cleaned out the pulp, pulp chamber, we, uh, we use stat gel, which is uh, ferric sulfate, to do the pulpotomy. Uh, essentially, you should try to have um, pretty arrested b bleeding before you go to the, the ferric sulfate. Uh, the good thing about the ferric sulfate, it doesn't smell like form former cresol. It may not be as effective as for former cresol, but uh, it doesn't have the, the, the bad odor. Uh, it's not carcinogenic. And also, um, uh, sometimes I, I wind up having to leave a former uh, a, a ferric sulfate pe pellet in for a while in order to get hemostasis. After that, clean it up. You can put an IRM floor in, or, or I use limelight. And then you could do a, a composite buildup. I'm not a big fan of stainless steel crowns for our program. And it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is that um, although pediatric dentists are very adept at uh, doing a prep for a, for a stainless steel crown and can get them to snap in very well, there is a learning curve in doing that. The other reason is is I don't uh, a kind of I don't unless the parent has given me verbal approval, I essentially don't want to. Uh, to do that and have the, uh, the parent uh, upset with the color of the stainless steel crown. Um, many uh, pediatric dentists are now using 
zirconium crowns because of the demand um, from parents to, to have something that's uh, more natural looking than a stainless steel crown. Uh, for teeth that require extractions, I like to uh, give the parent a, a heads up by calling them and informing them that they, the child has a baby tooth that needs to be extracted. If I can't get a hold of them, in general, I do the extraction, but I, I'll leave a message um, on their answer phone, and I'll also tell someone in the school that I try to get a hold of the parent, the child's baby tooth needed to come out, and um, I'm sorry that uh, I wasn't able to get a hold of them to give them a heads up and explain that to them before doing it. Uh, naturally, you have written consent to perform these procedures. Um, that about wraps up uh, everything that I that I wanted to go over in the um, in presenting the uh, hows and whys of the restorative procedures that I that I do. Um, I I just re remembered that I neglected to tell you what what size tip I use when I place the Accolade SRO Extra Light. I use a 22 gauge tip. Don't try using a 25 gauge, it won't make it through the tip. I don't like using an 18 gauge tip because the, uh, the flowable composite comes out uh, too fast. Um, for further reference, um, I'm the author of the clinical manual. Um, there's a lot in there. Also, feel free to call me or to email me or to text me with any questions that you might have. Um, as I said at the start, my name's Dr. Schlang. Um, the corporate office will, uh, will be more than happy to give you all my contact information. If you're new to the program, uh, Dr. Phil Trask of UCLA did an evaluation of the in-school program and he wrote a nice letter about it. I, I think it's a, a good letter if you're new to the program to read. And um, as I said, my, my main goal is to, is to do fast and efficient dentistry to give the, the child a calm and comfortable experience. And um, that brings me to something else that I would like to go, to go over. In general, um, I try to get all of the child's work done in one visit. And I do that f for several reasons. One being that follow-up visits usually will have a different dentist who will follow up to complete the work on the child. Um, and that dentist will have to look at the old records, see what was done, and it creates, a, let's say, a complicating factor. And the children, they, they kind of like to get it all done in one visit. Now, the, what I use as a kind of like a guideline is um, a half hour. A child in general, if, if you're not causing discomfort, will give you a half hour to get everything done. And um, when, I'm, uh, when, I give, when I give it a half hour, uh, if I try to go longer, Usually they, 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 they're ready to, um, to say, let's call it a day. So if I can get everything done in a half hour, I try to get them out, try to get all the treatment done, whether it's three fillings, whether it's six fillings. As I get to more fillings than that, it gets to be more challenging. But to give you an idea of how much dentistry I can get done using the techniques that I, that I described, uh, I, in general, um, if I have a, if I'm dealing with situations where there is uh, the usual amount of, of tooth decay, uh, I can get approximately 40 fillings done uh, between uh, 8.30 and 3 p.m. Um, it requires to, uh, great efficiency to be able to do that and uh, uh, considerable experience with, uh, with um, the different types of, uh, of behaviors that the children will present to you, but it, it, is, it is doable. Uh, what I neglected to talk about also is uh, the finishing of your fillings after you've put in your composite. 
whether, whether you use the compactable composite or whether you use the, um, the Accolade SRO flowable composite. I use uh, a red stripe um, egg diamonds. Uh, some dentists like the, the red stripe football diamonds. I find that it takes down the composite very well and very, very quickly. For inapproximal, I use flame-shaped uh, gold finishing burrs. And uh, you have all these, these, these burrs in your kits. I also, on interiors, um, I'll use um, pointy white finishing stones. And we have round white, white finishing stones. A couple of afterthoughts. Um, sometimes you'll diagnose a child and the child will have facial, squ facial swelling. Uh, uh, you may or may not be able to solve the problem by extracting the, the tooth. But in events when, when a child has facial swelling, whether we're going to treat the child or whether we're going to refer the, the child out, you'll want to prescribe antibiotics. Uh, the best way to find out of the, the pharmacy that you're going to use, call the parent, find out which pharmacy they prefer you to call the prescription into. And if you can't get a hold of the parent, then call it into the pharmacy that's closest to the school. Uh, for facial swelling, uh, also for, for gingival swelling, um, the antibiotics of choice will be amoxicillin. And if the child is allergic to the penicillins, then we go with, with the Zithromax. The prescribing instructions are, are, are in the clinical manual. Feel free to contact me with any, any questions that you might have. And uh, uh, if you feel like you'd, you, you need me to come out and, uh, and visit you and demonstrate anything, any of the things I've talked about, uh, usually we, we, um, we like to accommodate that. And I probably will be able to do that. Anyway, I, I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, any questions, contact me and I'll be happy to answer them for you.